Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Chris and Matthias. Uh, just to clarify, so um, I am actually talking less about research impact today um, and more focusing on um, our research quality evaluation as that's what's coming up next um, in our program uh, in 2023. Um, so slight shift of focus there. Um, also, to begin, I did just want to say, in case you missed our uh, network message we sent out recently, we have a new CEO. Uh, she started yesterday. Her name is Judy Zelke, and uh, Judy was previously the Chief Operating Officer at uh, CSIRO, uh, and she will be acting in that role uh, while we're recruiting for um, the permanent position. Uh, so that's a bit of news. Um, to begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we're meeting uh, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging uh, and to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, on the meeting today. I have the privilege of living and working on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. So today uh, I'm going to cover um, the ERA and EI, um, that's Excellence in Research for Australia and our Engagement and Impact Assessment, our two national uh, research assessments. Just a quick recap of some of the fundamentals for those new people. I want to talk about the review that we've just completed um, on those programs. Um, a bit of a focus on the minister's instructions, uh, which some of you may be aware of, um, and some of the next steps. So within Australia's national research assessment framework, we have two assessment exercises. Excellence in Research for Australia, which looks at research quality, and the engagement and impact assessment uh, which looks at how researchers are engaging with the end users of their research outside of academia and what the impact of that research is beyond academia. The two programs cover universities. Participation is not compulsory and it's not, or the outcomes are not tied to funding. In terms of the key differences between the programs, ERA evaluates research quality, as I said, we describe it as a comprehensive data collection. Uh, if something is eligible, it must be submitted. It's not a selective exercise. Uh, we have run this four times now. The fourth round was in 2018 and the next round is in 2023. For the engagement and impact assessment, hopefully the title actually reflects what it does. Um, it says the, the way um, researchers are engaging, as I said, with the end users uh, and also the impact of the research. This is most definitely a selective exercise uh, in contrast to ERA. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail about that. Um, we use uh, nar narratives, universities submit narratives or case studies for that. And we have a small suite of indicators for that assessment. We ran the first round of this program in 2018 and the next round will be in 2024. So just briefly, how do we evaluate research quality in ERA? Um, the key thing first, of course, is to define the unit of evaluation. Um, and for us, that is, that is not the um, department at the university, it's not the individual, it is the discipline at the university. And that is defined by the Australian and New Zealand uh, research classification. Um, and that's a, high, a hierarchical structure. And we look at those top two um, levels. So the broad discipline, as well as the specific disciplines underneath that. The indicators used in ERA include a range of metrics, such as citation profiles, which are common to disciplines in the natural sciences, or at least commonly used for assessment. Um, and that says and, but it should say or, peer review of a sample of research outputs, which we use to assess um, mostly the humanities and social sciences. So we don't use both kinds of methods. It's one or the other, depending on the discipline. And the outcomes from that evaluation, the ratings, are determined and moderated by committees of distinguished researchers from Australia and overseas. Um, and it's a, a rating scale, a five-point rating scale. 
So universities submit a whole lot of information to us, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of um, for ERA. Um, and, and this diagram shows uh, what that covers. The main focus, of course, being a research quality exercise is the outputs. So we collect all the uh, traditional research outputs, books, book chapters, journal articles and conference publications, as well as some non-traditional research outputs, such as creative works. We collect data about the eligible researchers in the university, um, and research income and applied measures, which are things like patents and plant breeders' rights. Um, and that is contextual information. And universities can also provide to us um, an explanatory statement, which provides some context for all of that data. Uh, for the engagement and impact assessment, um, again, the unit of assessment is the discipline at the university but we just stay at that very broad top level of the classification. Um, so the way the, the broadest definition of, of the discipline, not that, that um, more specific discipline. We separate the engagement of uh, the assessment of engagement and impact. Um, so we look at engagement and universities submit, submit to us information about research income that is end user focused or has that engagement element um, and also a narrative about about what uh, engagement activity has been undertaken by the researchers within that discipline over a three year period. Um, and then also an explanatory statement, um, again, providing in, uh, context to the indicators. On the impact side, uh, we do all of that uh, using um, narratives. So we have a case study for um, impact within the discipline, a single case study for the discipline. Um, and then universities also submit a narrative about the approach to impact, which is what the university has done to facilitate the delivery of impact within that discipline. We have expert panels who review that information and pr um, provide the ratings. Um, in ERA, those committee members are academics in um, the engagement and impact assessment. 30% of the panel members are research end users, uh, and then the rest are leading academics who have achievements in um, engagement with research end users and impact delivery. And there are three ratings that come out of that process, a rating for engagement, a rating for impact, and a rating for the approach to impact. So all of this gives us a huge amount of information, a lot of data, and of course the outcomes as well in the form of the ratings. We provide as much of that as we can um, on our website through our ARC data portal, which you can see here. So we have the national reports. We also publish things like the high rated impact studies um, as examples of best practice um, and the high rated engagement studies and, and a range of other material. In terms of the value of these programs, the main purpose of course is for um, universities and researchers to focus on research quality uh, and on research that has uh, direct impacts on the economy, society, environment and culture. But there are also other uses and users. Uh, so for universities, we know that this information is used in strategic planning, management and promotion. Students can also use this information for identifying areas of research strengths and expertise and opportunities for development. Government uses this information for informing policies and programs. Um, and that's not just the ARC and the Department of Education. Um, other departments across government also use this information. So for example, Department of Agriculture or Department of Environment or Defence, where they want to know where the national research strengths are uh, and the research capability, um, they will come to us and, and we use that data to provide information to them about that. Also, this information can be used by industry to identify pathways and partners for collaboration. And of course, I've got taxpayers there, they are assurance exercises. So they do provide that assurance uh, to um, everyday Australians that um, the government's investment in research is value for money. 
So we um, conducted a major review of both the programs in 2020 and 2021. Um, and the final report from the advisory committee uh, with the 22 recommendations from that review and the ARC's response to that are on our website. So I'm just going to take you through a little bit of uh, the review uh, and the recommendations. I'm not going to go through each of the detailed recommendations. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear, I'm sure. Uh, but if you need the detail, please go to those documents on our website. So the main focus of the review was uh, to simplify, one of the main areas of focus was to simplify and streamline um, the programs, particularly around the data collection burden for universities. And as part of that, to take advantage of technology and big data. Also to ensure that both those programs do and continue to reflect world's best practice and that they do and continue to respond to the needs of the university sector, government and the public. So in undertaking that review, we had an external advisory committee and the membership of that is on our website. Uh, that was chaired by Emeritus Professor Mike Brooks, who was acting VC of uh, Adelaide Uni at the time. So uh, a very busy person um, and did a great job with the committee. We received over a hundred submissions to the public consultation and most of those where we received permission, um, we have published on our website. We had several specialist working groups advising us through that process. Um, we commissioned an independent analysis of the impact methodology. Um, and that is also, that report is also on our website and very interesting reading um, for those of you who are particularly interested in the impact methodology. Um, and uh, we also undertook a, um, internal ARC data analysis uh, to inform that review. So I'm just going to pick out, I've just picked out some of the key uh, recommendations from the review. Um, as I said, not going through all of them today, uh, but one of the key things is the new vision and objectives. So we did need to modernise the objectives for ERA. They've been around for a long time. So we've done that. And then the new objectives for both programs are designed to um, articulate the alignment between the programs um, and the, the complementarity uh, and also uh, have developed a unified vision for both ERA and EI, which is that rigorous and transparent research assessment informs and promotes Australian universities' pursuit of research that is excellent, engaged with community, industry and government, and delivers social, economic, environmental and cultural impact. So we're not asking you to do much, just all of those things. Um, which I know a lot of universities have captured in their own um, mission statements as well as other things. Um, one of the other, or a couple of the other recommendations from the review are relate to assessing Indigenous studies. So some of you may be aware that um, the uh, ANSRIC, the, the research classification was reviewed a couple of years ago, and as part of that, Indigenous studies was reclassified. Um, it was uh, originally classified at that very granular level of the classification, and now it is um, a discipline in its own right uh, at the very top level of the classification and with the, the subdisciplines underneath. So the recommendation was that Indigenous studies be included in ERA and EI and that we use the same methodology as we use for other disciplines from the next rounds in 23 and 24. And what that really means is we're not doing a separate trial. Um, we are incorporating Indigenous studies as a discipline uh, in the same way as we do for other disciplines. We will be using peer review for all Indigenous studies disciplines in the era 2023 round. Um, and that's mainly because we don't have the data to know if we can actually do citation analysis, uh, but we will have that data once we've run the 23 round. So we will re review that um, after that. 
The other recommendation was about the importance of the ARC working with universities on leadership in implementing Indigenous studies. So we have uh, convened um, an Indigenous Studies Leadership Group called the Indigenous Studies Engagement and Excellence Leadership Group. Um, that is chaired by Professor Lisa Jackson Pulver from the University of Sydney and Professor Bronwyn Hart from the University of Queensland. Um, and they, that group has been very helpful to us so far. Um, and what we're aiming to do is uh, with them, help to raise awareness in universities about the Indigenous Studies discipline, about what universities need to do and how they need to engage with their Indigenous researchers on incorporating that uh, in those programs and also to provide guidance um, and clarification where that's needed. One of the other recommendations is around the rating scales and benchmarking in ERA. And um, I guess the short story is that it's time for a bit of a, a refresh or a, a revision of the, the rating scales and benchmarking. And this chart uh, kind of demonstrates one of the key reasons for that. Uh, the chart shows the distribution of ERA ratings across the four rounds of ERA uh, with ERA 2010 on the bottom there and ERA 2018 on the top. Um, the top ratings of four and five are in green, um, I think on the right hand side of your screen. And what you can see there is in era 2018, uh, we have 85% of units of evaluation at world standard or above. So it's time to have a look at those, uh, the benchmarks and the rating scales to ensure that we're building in um, a rising standard there for universities to still feel tested to achieve uh, that top research quality. So uh, we have, uh, convened a working group, a benchmarking and rating scale working group to help us with that. Um, and that is chaired by Professor Mark Weston from the University of Queensland. And we will be looking to put out a discussion paper on proposed changes to the rating scale and benchmarking, um, hopefully uh, fairly soon. So we will be seeking your views on that. Somewhat similarly, we'll be looking at the rating scales for engagement and impact. In 2018, we had a three-point rating scale, uh, which is a fairly coarse rating scale and doesn't provide a huge amount of information, um, particularly for universities, um, about performance. Um, and that we needed to do in the first round uh, while we were developing that um, methodology. Uh, now we're in a position where we can look at making that more granular. So we'll be consulting on that as well. As I said, streamlining was an important aspect of the review. Um, and one of the key areas we've been looking at is how we use existing data collections and particularly how we can adopt a collect once approach across government uh, in terms of data collection. So we have been doing quite a bit of work with the Department of Education on merging the ERA research income uh, collection and the Department of Education's higher education research data collection. Um, and also working with the department on aligning, not merging, but aligning um, some of the data that we collect on um, staff data. And that will help us to automate um, and pre-fill submissions in the future. Uh, we are looking to improve and increase the use of persistent identifiers such as ORCID and DOI. Um, and I'm sure you, a lot of you will know that there are complexities around that and particular, um, well, I won't go into it, but there are. So we'll be looking to do that uh, progressively. Um, we really encourage um, everybody to get on board and support that in your universities, uh, which I know you are. Um, also, we're looking to, uh, as a recommendation out of the review, adopt a byline method for the eligibility of your publications. Um, and this will, again, help us to um, automate and pre-fill submissions. Um, just on the pre-filling of submissions, um, ultimately, we want to get to a point where we're doing as much of that as we can for universities, um, but we'll never be able to get away 
I don't think, uh, from universities having to verify their data. Uh, but we'll be aiming to get as close as we can to doing the job for you. Also on the streamlining um, subject focus, um, there were recommendations about reducing peak workload for universities. Uh, so one of the recommendations is that ERA and EI will run in consecutive years, which they will, they are going to be doing for 23 and 24. Um, and we will never have hopefully the 20, year of 2018 uh, and EI 2018 situation again. That was a little bit challenging for everyone, I know. Um, so that's what we're doing there. Uh, we are looking and the recommendation was to run the programs um, on a three year cycle, um, but that depends on the effectiveness of the streamlining measures. So we will be working with universities and we'll be looking at that particularly after the next rounds um, and consulting with universities on that question of frequency. Um, we're also, there's a recommendation about moving to annual reporting to reduce peak workload. But again, and that would be for future rounds, not for the next rounds. Uh, but again, that depends on the streamlining and the, the automated data collection side of things. Uh, and again, we'll be talking to universities about that uh, as we go forward. Again, on streamlining, uh, there are recommendations about removing unnecessary data, in particular for ERA, that is the applied measures. Um, and with the engagement and impact assessment in place, we no longer really need to have the applied measures in ERA, uh, and particularly with the focus of ERA being on research quality. Uh, so uh, that's the recommendation there. On the peer review and citation analysis methodologies, there were recommendations around benchmarking, which I've already talked about, also about transparency, uh, which is really important for you know, these big evaluations of, of university performance. Uh, we in the past have published the, the metadata, the publication metadata that um, universities have submitted for ERA. Uh, we're gonna be adding to that the field of research assignments to the publications. Um, also, we're looking at measures for improving the training of our committees, particularly for ERA, their understanding of world standard and the benchmarking and rating scale um, across both the peer review and citation uh, methodologies. And there are recommendations around empowering the committee members to take action where they see um, misleading or inaccurate data submitted. Um, and so they will have the, the power to remove uh, inaccurate information or even an entire unit of evaluation um, and to either not assess it or to request citation profiles to be uh, recalculated. In terms of the timing of implementation, um, there's uh, some things that we can do in era 23 and 24. Um, a lot of these things we will be looking to implement um, in subsequent rounds, um, particularly those, those data collection things because um, it's a retrospective exercise. So we've moved past that collection period really for era. Um, and we're very conscious that these things take time uh, in terms of changes to your systems um, and procedures as well. Um, minister's expectations. Some of you may be aware that the minister wrote a letter to the previous CEO on the 6th of December last year, outlining his expectations for the ARC. Uh, this actually isn't all that unusual, um, other agencies, statutory agent, agencies such as the CSIRO have uh, letters of expectations, uh, which they have on their websites. And we have now put this one on our website. There are a couple of um, instructions in that letter that relate to our uh, two national evaluation programs. Um, and one is for the department to work sorry, the ARC to work with the department to develop robust quantitative metrics that are more explicitly focused on the impact of research uh, 
uh, for EI 2024. So that's metrics that recognise patents, IP and commercial agreements and less emphasis on the case studies to measure impact. But, so that is a little bit of a change. Um, and we will be working with the department on that. And of course, coming out to universities uh, for consultation on that. Um, also, the other instruction in the letter that relates to us is the um, establishing an expert working group to develop a revised rating scale for ERA. And as I mentioned, we already have the group up and running. Some of the key things that the minister wants to look at are that the rating scale sets the world standard benchmark against those nations and universities that are at the forefront of research. Um, and that it provides a comparator that will set a rising standard over time and is underpinned by a benchmarking structure that is clear in its ambition and provides granular and meaningful reporting on the level of achievement across different universities. So uh, you can see how when I, I, I showed the, um, the rating outcomes, the distribution earlier, I was talking about um, really that ambition for improvement. So that's what we need to build in there. Um, and again, we've been working with the working group and we're working with the department. Um, and as I said, we will come out with a discussion paper on that uh, for your thoughts. So next steps. I actually know you are already assigning field of research codes from the ANZRIC 2020, including the Indigenous Studies codes uh, to your era data. I'm sure you're all very much in the thick of it. Um, also uh, preparing for consultation uh, on a range of things, most of which I've already mentioned. The journal list for era 2023 is out open now, that consultation. It closes on the 7th of March um, and that's being coordinated through university research offices. Um, the draft submission guidelines will come out soon uh, for consultation. It does include a short paper on preprints. So we are looking for views on whether or not preprint prints should be included um, in ERA as a research output category. Um, and as I said, the benchmarking and rating scale um, EI indicators and impact studies and byline methodology are all coming for consultation. So finally, just to say, yes, the guidelines are coming soon. I can tell you uh, key changes in the guidelines include the adoption of those updated objectives for ERA, the adoption of the ANZRIC 2020 codes, including the 45 Indigenous studies, streamlining research income uh, data collected to align with the herd C changes. So for the category one income, that will be collected at the category level. So the grant ID data is not required. The proportion of grant completed in the reference period is not required. Category three industry and other um, income will be collected at the category level as well. We will be remo removing the applied measures. Um, and publishing the ERA data after ERA 23 uh, will include the field of research assignments for the research outputs. And finally, that stronger action that we've um, uh, provided for the research evaluation committees uh, to take action on false and misleading information. So being able to remove incorrectly coded data um, and request recalculated citation profiles where that's appropriate. So that is all I have. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm very happy to take questions. And I will stop sharing. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a really interesting oversight, just uh, where the Australian Research Council is looking moving forward. Uh, I don't know how you want to uh, run the questions, with Matthias. I've been following some of the chat, some of the questions uh, or comments that people have been making. Uh, um, how would you like to run it? I, I am easy. I'm more than happy for you to facilitate if you like. I have just posted a link to where most of the questions are in the chat. Uh, so you should be able to click on that link. Oh, uh, yeah. Adlet. Uh, 
Uh, look, Sarah, I'd like to thank you for addressing that uh, expectations from the minister. I was too afraid to ask uh, because I know it is, it's not entirely appropriate to ask uh, staff of the ARC to comment on politics. So. No, and I would never comment on politics, but that letter is on our website uh, and I, I knew it was a bit of an elephant in the room probably, so worth talking about. Absolutely. Well, just following up on that, uh, Sarah, um, there was some comments in there regarding uh, very strongly the em emphasis on commercialisation, in particular, uh, mm -hmm. with output. Uh, and of course, that has an issue for Haas in particular. I mean, um, are there other, I mean, are those just examples or are we, would we be looking at other things, for instance, where there's quantum, I mean, it's ter terrifically challenging, as we all know, for getting metrics on this, but for instance, measures of where uh, work has impacted directly on policy, for instance, or other other aspects, rather than just commercial. Not, not that that's not important, of course, but there's a whole wealth of other things that impact-wise that uh, researchers do. Is is that something for consideration, or is it very much patents, IP, commercial agreements only? Uh, yeah, so those are examples, uh, the research commercialisation examples. Um, but we do need to have indicators that can go across all disciplines. So that's certainly something that we're working on. Um, and as I think some of you may recall from the 2018 round, we did have a list of um, potential indicators or um, kinds of evidence that universities could include, quantitative evidence that universities could include if they wanted to um, with their impact studies. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we, we might be looking at. It's difficult to say right now exactly where we'll end up, uh, but certainly very conscious that we do, where, where we have indicators, we need to look at how that works across all of the disciplines. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, I'll start up with the... Uh, uh, so one of the questions was, uh, our researchers are also active as journal editors, peer reviews, etc. How are these activities considered in the research assessment exercises? So, sorry, just can I check um, activities such as editor, editorship uh, of Yeah, journal, that's right, peer reviews, obviously things which phenomenally underpin the whole mm. ability for us to do research. Is how is that considered, if at all? Yeah, so I mean, we do acknowledge that that's really important work that researchers do, um, uh, and it it's obviously takes a lot of time and effort. Um, however, our two national uh, research assessment exercises don't include that. No. Uh, that that's just something separate. No, that's okay. Thank you. I, I thought that was okay. Um, you were talking about actually how we compare internationally to other um, research nations, uh, research active. And one of the questions actually was asking, how, how does our, our assessment process compare to some of those others? I'm thinking things like the US, Europe, Britain. How do they compare? I mean, I know coming from a British perspective, of course, there's money attached to that. There's a whole bunch of other things that are going on mm. with the knowledge exchange as well. Um, is that something we're working closely with those countries or taking the best that works for us in the environment? Yeah, look, we do do a lot of work with our international counterparts um, and we do, um, yeah, track what's going on in different countries. Um, we even subscribe to a journal called Research Evaluation. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. how nerdy we are. Um, so, yes, we do keep track of that. The US is quite different. They certainly don't have a national assessment system, uh, yeah. but they do do some things in different areas. Um, and uh, really, I guess what we do is most closely comparable to the UK, uh, but Italy um, and Hong Kong and, and some other countries are doing similar things. I mean, there are sort of, I guess, standard ways in which you can do a national assessment. Um, it, it's very different when you take, for example, an impact assessment to a project level. It's a very different kind of assessment that you might do uh, compared to when you have to scale it up for a national assessment. So there aren't too many countries that do it, um, either on the research quality or um, impact. Um, and they, 
we all kind of coalesce around a few key things. Um, some uh, use metrics, uh, particularly the citation metrics uh, for research quality, others do not. Um, that's uh, becoming increasingly um, incorporated into the UK system, but not in the same way that we do it. Um, and research impact, um, well, the way even research impact is defined can be quite different across different countries. And then of course, the way you define it determines then how you're gonna measure it. Um, but case studies uh, do feature um, in a lot of the national level assessments um, with more or less focus on indicators. Oh, fantastic. No, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, one of the questions that someone had was, um, when, uh, who will be the citation provider for ERA 2023? Do we, do we know that? Oh, or? that's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, every time we do this, um, you know, as a government agency, we have to go out uh, for a competitive tender process. Right. Uh, and that competitive tender is um, open uh, at the moment. Um, and we will keep you posted uh, wow. as we work through that process. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, one of the questions that just came through just a moment ago was, uh, will resources be available to help the community support our researchers in understanding of requirements and assessment criteria. So I'm, I'm assuming things like uh, this person's asking for, uh, will there be open sessions, presumably? Will there be some sort of online resources that people can access or institutions can access? Yeah, that's certainly something um, we're focusing on this year is, is producing those resources uh, that you will all need, um, different resources for people in different roles. Um, we'll be producing a, um, well, previously, previously, it's been an evaluation handbook, um, which, which tells you how um, the committee members um, or the panel members in EI will assess. Um, and so we will be doing that. Um, and we'll be producing with the guidelines, the submission guidelines, there are a whole range of other technical documents as well, but of course that's on the submission side. Um, we will, and very happy to do webinars. Uh, we've been increasingly doing that because, I mean, previously in old fashioned times, we used to travel around the country, um, but now we're increasingly doing webinars. So, you know, very happy to do uh, as many of those as uh, people think are needed um, and that we can actually fit in. Um, but, you know, it's really important to us that we feel like you feel confident um, and about uh, understanding what we're doing and how we do it. Oh, well, that's fantastic. I've just seen a note from Matthias. There's a whole load of other questions, but I, I fear we've run out of time. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. It was fabulous to get your insights and uh, hear where things are at. And, uh, and if everyone could uh, join me in virtually thanking Sarah <laughs> for her time, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And look, I'm, I'm very happy to, to follow up with other questions. Um, perhaps Matthias, you know, let me know if there's a way to do that, uh, if, if people want me to.